If a person would like to be saved and be in a right relationship with God and live with Him forever, what, what's required to achieve that? On our program today, we're studying from the book of Romans. Please get your Bible and stay tuned. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love Welcome to The Truth in Love, and now your host, Dave Miller. Great to see you. Thank you for watching our television program. We are in the midst of a study of the book of Romans, and I invite you to get your Bible and examine these passages of Scripture with me. This is a tremendous treatise that Paul left for us by inspiration pertaining to the concept of justification by faith. We've been using this uh, contrast to help us to kind of see the orientation of this book. We've said that whereas the book of Acts is designed to describe for us how people responded to the gospel. Therefore, Acts portrays the conditions of salvation. But in contrast to that, Romans indicates the grounds of salvation. It shows us the foundational premises, the basis upon which God can grant forgiveness to the sinner. So there's a helpful contrast between those two books to see the difference. We might also move to the uh, thematic statement of chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So to summarize once again that basic thematic statement of the book of Romans, look at this sentence with four words that are enlarged to see the major concepts indicated in this book. The gospel, that is the good news about Jesus dying for us, is God's power, that is, it is His sole means to save, that is, to justify, to cause people to be forgiven of sin, all who will believe. And of course, believe in this book means to respond obediently to the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. On our outline, we can see that we have looked at after examining the thesis in chapter 1, we've looked at the great need for the gospel, which is due to sin. Both Gentile and Jew have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We then moved in chapter 3, verse 21, to the solution, stated very succinctly in that chapter, and then in chapter 4, illustrated in Abraham, and in chapter 5, the benefit and extent of gospel salvation was indicated. Then we moved to chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, and examined sin... Uh, as it relates to the gospel and to law. And then we moved on to this section that virtually stands alone in the book, chapter 9, 10, and 11, which explains to us the question, what about the Jews? How do they fit into the great gospel scheme? In fact, these three chapters are designed to answer these questions. Why have the Jews largely rejected Christ? How do we account for that? Is God at fault for this rejection? What is the current spiritual condition of the Jew? How do Jews fit into God's gospel system? Has God, in fact, rejected the Jews? Or will the Jews be saved? Can the Jews be saved? Upon what basis can Jews be saved? Can they be saved in, in the same way everyone is saved, or are they saved in some unique way? These are basically uh, the questions that Paul discusses as he works through chapters 9, 10, and 11. We worked through chapter 9 in our last program, and we moved into chapter 10. I'd like for you to read with me chapter 10, verse 12 and verse 13. And we will continue our study of this great chapter based upon these verses. Chapter 10 and verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Keep that verse up there for just a moment. And look at the words, no distinction. Same Lord over all, to all, 
uh, who call upon him, and then look at the word whoever. Do you see that all of those terms, all of those expressions, those words, are used to stress the universality of the gospel? So the gospel is available to everyone, and that is the thrust of these two verses. We must not interpret these two verses to mean that anyone can be saved by just orally standing there and calling on the Lord. That's not what Paul's talking about. The contrast that he's making is that you can either obey the gospel or you can depend upon your racial and ethnic heritage and background, which is what Jews wanted to do. But he says, no, it's not that way. It's whoever calls on the Lord. That is, Jew or Gentile can be responsive to God. He doesn't go into the details of what that entails. But we know from Acts that it involves, among other things, water immersion. So there's either obeying the gospel, calling upon the Lord, obeying the stipulations that are prerequisite to salvation, or there is depending upon your ethnicity and your Jewishness. And of course, Paul is making the point here by quoting Joel chapter 2, verse 32, that uh, the only way anybody can be saved, whether Jew or Gentile, is to give a personal, individual response to the gospel of Christ. And one must go primarily to Acts, but you could go to Romans 6 to see some of the details of what that entails. Now let's move to chapter 10, verse 14, and see the continuation of his line of thought. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Look closely at the sequence that he lays out there. You have a hearer who has to hear. You have after, um, first the gospel has to be preached in order for a hearer to hear. Once a hearer hears the gospel, then the hearer must believe. Once the believer believes, then the believer must call on the name of the Lord. Notice that believing in Jesus and calling upon Jesus are not the same thing. It's incredible to me that much of Christendom has concluded that a person merely has to believe in their hearts, accept Jesus as their Savior. And if you ask them, where, where would you get that passage? They would say, well, the passages that say believe. But then there are passages that say call on the name of the Lord. And they would say, well, that's the same thing. No, it's not. Paul here in Romans chapter 10 makes clear that you can't call until you first believe, and you can't believe unless you first hear. So a hearer becomes a believer, and then a believer becomes a caller. Those are two separate actions. And therefore, Paul is not excluding the essentiality of water immersion in proper response to the gospel of Christ. Now, his point in chapter 10, 14, and 15 is the fact that the gospel originally had to be given miraculously by God through the apostles. That's really what this verse is talking about. How can they hear unless the gospel is preached? How can they hear without a preacher? He's talking about the original apostolic emissaries that disseminated the gospel universally around the planet for the first time in human history. That was in the first century. Remember, remember Jesus gave the great commission before he ascended back into heaven? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 16, uh, Luke chapter 24, 46 and following. We call that the Great Commission where he commissioned the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Paul's referring to here. The original proclamation of the gospel had to be achieved by inspired men who were given the ability to present the terms of the gospel for the first time on this planet. So Romans 10, 14 through 15 is talking about that action, he even quotes from the Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings. That's those original inspired spokesmen that disseminated the, the gospel initially on this planet. So notice that unlike the Jew who thought, I can be saved, I can be approved of God by simply being a Jew, being born of Jewish parents and living as a Jew. Here, Paul makes clear that is not the case. 
The only way you can be approved of God, saved, forgiven of sin, acceptable in God's sight is through a system, a gospel system, which requires you to hear, understand, and comply, obey, submit. That's the only way a person can be saved. The Christian system, the gospel format, is what's necessary in order for a person to gain access to Jesus Christ and ultimate forgiveness. So your genetic heritage does not enable you to become a Christian. It has nothing to do with it. It never has had anything to do with it. God didn't save people automatically, even prior to the cross, just because they were descended from Abraham. Their genetic connection to Abraham brought other blessings, but not personal salvation. That has always been predicated in the great scheme of God's redemption. It has always been predicated upon an individual obedient faith, a response that complies with God's will. All right, let's move to verse 16. Romans chapter 10 and continuing in verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. All right, what is Paul doing here? He is continuing the idea of personal, individual responsibility as over against one's ethnic connection to your uh, forefathers, your Abrahamic heritage. He's stressing that you must give an individual personal response. Jews have to, Gentiles have to, everyone has to. We must all give the same response as stipulated by Jesus Christ in the terms of the gospel. So Paul's point is, that the gospel had in fact been made available to everybody. It's been a universal proclamation. And yet, most have rejected the gospel. Most people have rejected Jesus Christ and the solution that He offers. Especially that is true with the Jews. You know, both then and now. Jesus made that point that the bulk of the nation of Israel in His day rejected Him. Paul made that point. Throughout the first century, the bulk of the Jewish nation rejected him. And isn't it that way today? So this is very central to um, an elaboration upon the, the terms of gospel salvation. Paul's saying that the word has gone out. They have heard. They have had access to it. And yet most have rejected it, especially among the Jews. So the gospel has to be heard. It has to be believed. It has to be obeyed in order for a person to be made righteous, to gain access to the forgiving blood of Jesus Christ. And so his point here in verses 16 through 18 is that God has no other means of making people righteous. You cannot depend upon your racial affiliation or any other connection that you may have. You must depend upon Jesus and the gospel and the access to forgiveness that is achieved when one renders obedience to this great commission offering salvation universally to the entire world. Colossians 1, 23 indicates that the gospel went out to the whole world even in the first century. But when you hear the gospel and what Jesus has done for you, you must render obedience by an obedient trust, culminating in water immersion for the remission of your sins. That brings us then to verse 19. Listen to Paul in Romans 10, 19. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Paul is saying that physical Jews in his day were without excuse. The gospel had gone out to the whole world. It had gone out to Jew. It had gone out to Gentile. Both Moses and Isaiah predicted that the Jews as a whole would reject the gospel 
while many Gentiles would accept it. Isn't that tragic and sad? But these quotations that he gives us from Moses and Isaiah document that fact. The, the Gentiles were so alienated from God throughout human history that he had to pursue them. And in Paul's day, he was pursuing them by sending them the gospel. The Jews, on the other hand, had close contact with God. And they should have readily obeyed the gospel and accepted Christ when He came. That was the natural sequel to their relationship with God through the centuries. But tragically, it did not happen. That brings us then to Romans chapter 11 and verse 1. Read this with me as we continue through this trilogy of chapters. I say then, has God cast away His people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul, are you saying, leading up to this chapter here, Paul, are you saying that, that God has rejected the Jews? That's how it's turned out, that God's ended up just rejecting the physical nation of Jews? And his answer to that is no. God extends salvation to everyone, Jew and Gentile, on the same terms. And Paul says as proof of that, as proof that even Jews have access to salvation, this side of the cross, Paul says, I'm exhibit A. I'm a Jew. You know, Paul was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was an Israelite of Israelites. But Paul rejected or gave up his Judaism, counted all that as loss, he said, and he obeyed the gospel and became a Christian. So that's proof that Jews can be saved, that God has not simply rejected the Jews because they're Jews. They have access to salvation on the same basis. So Paul was saved, but not because he was a Jew. Paul was not saved by being a Jew. He was saved by becoming a Christian, by obeying the gospel. Do you understand then that the physical nation of Israel was never automatically saved by mere virtue of their racial connection to Abraham? Salvation has always been an individual matter. And I am convinced that so much of the teaching in Christendom today about the modern state of Israel and their alleged special position or favor in the sight of God is a direct contradiction to the book of Romans as well as many other passages in both the Old and the New Testament. There are no physical Jews today who have any special advantages or privileges or uh, access to God above and beyond what everyone else has. All people stand before Jesus Christ. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, and no one has any special advantages. Therefore, salvation is an individual matter. It always has been. Even when God was working through the nation of Israel throughout those centuries leading up to Jesus, He was working with them and through them for, for reasons other than their personal salvation. That was a matter individually for them to decide in their daily walk. And so it is today. It so happens that the bulk of the physical nation of Israel rejected the gospel, and so as a nation they rejected God. Now look how Paul continues this line of thought in chapter 11, verse 2. He says, God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew, or do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. This is a great reference back to 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, I believe. Paul is saying that throughout the Mosaic dispensation, you know, the law of Moses was given in 1500 B.C., so for 1,500 years before Jesus came to this planet, the Mosaic dispensation, God interacted with Jews through the law of Moses. He continued to interact with non-Jews, Gentiles, through patriarchal law. But throughout that Mosaic dispensation, there was a remnant of Jews whom God foreknew. 
What's he mean? He means there were always a handful of Jews that were truly faithful, trusting, and obedient to God, and therefore personally and individually saved. But the rest of the Jewish nation was not through all of those centuries. Elijah's proof of that, Elijah said, look how so much of the nation is apostate. In fact, he said, I'm the only one that's left. God said, no, there are 7,000 faithful Israelites in your day, Elijah. So back there at the time Elijah was living, there were at least 7,000 people who were still faithful and still considered saved by God. What's that say about the rest of the Jewish nation, which involved millions of people? They were not saved. But wait a minute, they're Jews. They're God's chosen people. They're not saved. They were God's chosen people in the sense that He chose them to work through them to bring Christ into the world and to achieve ultimate salvation. But His working with them as an ethnic group had nothing to do whatsoever with their own personal salvation. They had to make that choice individually just as non-Jews had to make that choice. So these are important truths that Paul is stressing. There have always been some among the Jews who were in a saved condition. The vast majority of them throughout history have been lost. Look at verse 5, Romans 11, verse 5. Paul continues, So, at this present time, there is a remnant, notice that term that he uses, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. That's Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. What does he mean, even so at this present time? He means now under the gospel era, since Christ has come, during the gospel dispensation, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. What does he mean, the election of grace? He's talking about the gospel. The gospel is the grace system that God offers in order to bring people into a state of election, that is, being forgiven, justified. So even though Jews are not saved on the basis of their ethnicity through the Mosaic system of salvation, all of that now being done away with, no longer in effect, nevertheless, individual Jews could still be saved and can still be saved by obeying the gospel of Christ. He says, all right, if it's by grace, that is, if it's by this gospel system of grace, then it's no longer by works. What does he mean by works? If you listen to Protestant denominationalism over the last 500 years, when they say, oh, it's not by works, we're saved by grace, they mean we're not saved by things like baptism. That's ridiculous. Baptism is a work that God has given us to do. The works in Romans are not talking about the steps that lead to salvation, faith, repentance, confession of Christ with a mouth, and water immersion. Those are not the works that he's talking about. He's talking about Jewish works. He's talking about the things that Jews did that made them think they could be saved on that basis. The number one work was circumcision. Here was a surgical, physically surgical procedure which they thought set them apart from everybody else and would guarantee their salvation in God's sight. No, it's by grace, not by works. It's by the grace system. It's by obeying the gospel of Christ. It's not by your Jewish ethnicity and all of these stipulations that you Jews think make you distinct from everybody else. That is the point that he's making in the book of Romans and specifically in chapter 11 verses 5 and 6. So the gospel of grace enables a person to be justified from violations of law. A strictly legal work system cannot justify you once you violate it. A grace system, that is the gospel of Christ, which includes laws, it doesn't exclude law, it includes law, but it makes provision for you when you violate law. It makes it possible for you to be forgiven. Now he continues here in chapter 11, verse 7 and following, talking about the condition of the Jews. He says, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it and the rest were hardened. Just, it is, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. Again, he's talking about the fact that Jews sought to be acceptable to God on the basis of their purely legal, racial approach 
uh, to God and His will. But that would not do it. They have to turn and obey the gospel of Christ. These are great truths. We have so much more to study. I'll be back to offer you some free material in just a moment. Stay tuned for this song together. Well, this great book of Romans is surely a treasure of richness. It is designed to help us to understand what lies at the basis of our potential for being saved and acceptable to God and to Christ. I hope you're enjoying this study, and we're going to make this available to you in audio cassettes. If you will write us at The Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Request the series on the book of Romans, and we'll be happy to put you on the list and to send these to you once they are complete. Please feel free to uh, contact us uh, by email. You can go to our webpage and examine materials that are available. We have lots of materials from the past that we offer all of this free, no cost or obligation. We're happy to make it available to you in hopes that you will render obedience to Jesus Christ and to the God of the universe. May God bless you until we meet again. Colorful revelation has been given to men. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth.